We're speaking to you from Loyola University Water Tower Campus, Corboy Law School, Casbear Hall, and it's the location of the Thorium Energy Alliance Future of Energy Conference number four. Jim Kennedy and I were not able to say much at the last uh, conference, especially about the political work we were doing at the request of the folks we were working with. And at the time, we were very optimistic that we were just weeks away of some uh, important bills being introduced. But as we found out that, uh, you know, politics is a strange thing. So, you know, I can sum up the, the results pretty, <laughs> pretty succinctly by saying one party thought the idea of setting up a central supply chain for rare earths and a thorium bank to store and use thorium responsibly was a monopoly. Uh, thank goodness that the other party only just accused us of being socialists who were trying to set up a commune for materials and energy. So that all went well. Uh, oh, and, and they said that free markets would fix everything. And we were also told that the USA does not do industrial policy anymore, which is too bad because industrial policy is what made America great. It's also what is making all the Asian tigers and China and even the Celtic tiger uh, at one time so, so prosperous. So I don't think an industrial policy is bad. One that at least levels the playing field, that's not bad. You know, a WTO lawsuit, you know, can go to hell. When you are the only one playing by the rules, it's time to bring some jujitsu to the table. You know, if the rules are even, we can play the, by those rules better than anyone else. You know, we can do this. I live fairly modestly. We live in a small house. I drive an 18-year-old Saturn. <laughs> You know, so we're fairly frugal, but I'm still an American, so that means I use vast amounts of resources no matter how frugal I am. You have that yellow vertical tube there is the uh, reacting chamber, and it goes into a single pump, so you don't have triple, quadruple, quintuple, redundant cooling pumps. It goes through a heat exchanger, exchanges heat to another salt, and runs hopefully some sort of Brayton cycle or advanced steam cycle supercritical CO2 something, or you go out to a heat loop and you do work with the heat because why would you lose 50% of your energy just to make electricity when instead you could probably take that nice sweet seven to 800 degree salt and use it to process maybe coal into liquid fuels, turn coal from the dirtiest, filthiest energy into maybe one of the cleanest energy sources. Uh, or maybe you could make fertilizer, desalinate water. You've all heard the stories about what you can do with high temperature process. I run an engineering company and we do engineering consulting and one of the uh, clients we have asked us to do some engineering and find a material replacement. They thought thorium might be able to do that. We learned about this. Vince and I learned about it and people want to know what value is there in thorium. and. There's no monetary value in thorium, it's, it's actually just the opposite. If, if you found a way to get rid of thorium, many companies would uh, pay you to take it off their hands. It's a, it's a big liability today. It didn't match his needs, but I just plain old could never let go of it. It's not going to help them, but you know, it could save the world. Back in the 60s, a real honest to God, not paper reactor, ran for 22,000 full power hours at six megawatts of heat. If you ever visit Oak Ridge National Lab, you can actually see the MSRE building is still there and it's still used as an office building and the remnants of the MSR are still there. Once you learn something, you know, you can't pretend you didn't learn it and you can't pretend that you don't know what a powerful thing this is. And you can choose to do that, but that's not the moral choice to make, right? To ignore it, to pretend you didn't learn it, so the moral thing, the right thing to do is to just do what we're doing, which is, in my opinion, it's sort of the bare minimum. If you know that there's a powerful way to save our society and maybe serve mankind in general, but you do nothing about it, then what good are you? That building is 18 years old. And you don't have to be religious, superman or super motivated or an evangelist to have that attitude, because I'm certainly none of those things. That salt wants to be solid so when the terrorists fly their plane into the reactor and they crack it open the fueled salts and the blanket salts would fall into the uh, curved bottom the swimming pool there and drain down into these storage tanks and solidify in a matter of days if you had a little more controlled thing than a terrorist attack if somehow the system overheated for some reason there's a salt plug basically just the same salt that the fuel is 
and it's kept frozen by literally just blowing a fan on it. That's how they did it back in the 60s. They just blew a fan on a section of pipe. And if something like Fukushima happened where we lost power, the fan would stop blowing, the plug in the pipe would melt, and voila, the whole thing drains down into the containment tanks in the lower gallery. Rare earth interests and thorium interests, they have a symbiotic relationship and we're working towards getting some legislation passed that would allow rare earth production to restart in the United States and by doing that we would start a thorium bank that would take responsibility and accept the liability of, of taking on all the thorium and finding uses for it including energy uses. New rules and regulations that pertain just to thorium and not all nuclear fuels together because a lot of times what people don't realize is thorium is, regula is regulated the same way that uranium and plutonium is to a great extent. If you're you know, Fred's house of you know, radiation remediation, you're going to be like, it's dangerous, it's dangerous. You know, so you've got guys you know, that have a very vested interest in keeping this you know, as, as scary as possible. So it's, it's really a radiation problem in that the, yeah, public, the public system, yeah. the decision makers don't understand. If we spilled 10 kilograms of thorium here, it would be a calamity. They would literally tear the, the top floor off of this building. I mean, that's how they would treat it. And they would, they would barrel up every single one of these things, and they'd send it to the whip, you know. <laughs> and the whole building would, be, would have to be, you know, decontaminated. I mean, that's how they would treat it, even though they'd visit the exposure lab at the University of Cincinnati, and they've got all these gelatin dummies that they actually blow like plutonium dust and ur uranium dust and thorium dust and they actually see the, the radiation exposure to this like ballistic gel and how it tra travels and they also old uh, workers like that worked on the Manhattan Project will their bodies to them and they they, they dissolve the bodies in uh, HF and, and uh, other acids and then they sift it out and see how much plutonium and uranium and stuff wound up in their bodies. Yeah, it's sort of like donating your body to science. So they've got really, really good, very, very long-term exposure studies of just how much of this stuff builds up in the body. Thorium's uh, not dissolvable. You know, you can't, uh, uh, you know, utilize it in your body at all. It won't build up in your system. It goes right through you. We want a set of regulatory uh, uh, decisions made that will help thorium be used uh, more efficiently and more successfully, or, or at all, I guess I should say. Thorium isn't the future of energy. Molten salt reactors aren't the future of energy. You are the future of energy. You are the future of energy, and I'm not placing my bets on a gray rock, and I'm not placing my bets on some machine. I'm placing my bets on the people in this room. So now let's go do this. Thank you very much.